Welcome, everybody. It is Health Talk. Hi, I'm Peter Christian. John King's over there waiting to take your phone calls at 721-1290. But uh, Dr. Robert Moonshaw is joining us this morning. And this is fascinating because we we have talked about a lot of different aspects with Providence uh, uh, St. Patrick's Services. Talked about we've already had, had a hospitalist on from the hospital. But we've never talked to somebody involved in psychiatry or psychology. And so here you are. So, so welcome. Thank you very much for having me this morning, Peter. You, you bet. And uh, let me just read this. Uh, you, you cover yours if you want to. So this is <laughs> Dr. Robert Moonjaw, born and raised in the Mid-Atlantic region. After completing his undergraduate studies at the College of William and Mary, he worked as a research assistant at the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins and went on to medical school at the University of Virginia. After graduating medical school, he completed an internship in psychiatry at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., went on to complete residency and a fellowship in Baltimore at the University of Maryland and Shepherd Pratt. Since graduating, he's been proud to call Missoula home, when not working, enjoys Montana's mountains, rivers, and the big sky. So, welcome to uh, What in the World Brought You to Montana? I, we, we've been talking about this before the show. Yeah, we, we came here for uh, the adventure that brings most outsiders to Montana. And uh, we, we love getting lost in the mountains and the rivers. I, I caught a rainbow trout this weekend, which cool. was just wonderful. And uh, couldn't, couldn't pick a better place to raise a family. So, so how many kids do you have? Uh, three. Three kids. Wow. So it was, I bet it was a fun Father's Day for you. Oh, we had a great time. We went canoeing and sat out by the fire with friends and, and just had a blast. It was wonderful. All right. So what, what is it about your job that you enjoy the most? Uh, because you're, you're a psychiatrist, right? Yeah. So, oh, so tell us what I, it is about the, 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 the human brain that just fires you up. I never have a boring day at work. You know, <laughs> I, I, get to, I get to just uh, listen to the richness of, of people's lives and their stories and, and what makes people tick. And, uh, you know, most of us bear some sort of hardship in this life. And, and uh, I get the extreme privilege of being led into some of those details and uh, people opening up very vulnerably and talking about uh, the things in their lives that have shaped them. And then we also take a look at, at what may be going on in somebody's brain biochemically that, mm-hmm. that may be affecting them or may be an obstacle to them being their, their best self. Tell me a little bit about Providence. Now, Providence is in a different, you know, the Providence Center, basically, is in a different location than St. Patrick Hospital. So is that where you're located? That's right. So we're the same institution as St. Patrick Hospital, but we are in a different location. Uh, we've got both inpatient psychiatric services, folks that need to come in and stay in a hospital to get some sanctuary from their stress and get a more in-depth assessment and be in a safe place. We also have outpatient services that include therapists and psychiatrists uh, to help folks that are getting by uh, but but need some additional help to, to uh, deal with their emotional state and their stresses. Now, would you help me out with something? Because as a layman, Sometimes I find it difficult to, to know the difference between psychology and psychiatry. What's That's how, right. how we, those two? You yeah. know, we, we look at a similar set of uh, problems that people may deal with. Uh, psychology encompasses a much broader field that includes uh, a lot of academic disciplines and research interests. It's not exclusively a clinical field, whereas psychiatry really is primarily clinical. Everybody who's a psychiatrist has gone to medical school, completed training in pediatrics, obstetrics, surgery, just like any other doctor. Uh, but then after medical school has gone on to subspecialize within the field of psychiatry, mental health, and, and neuro- neurology um, is also included in that training. So when, 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 you, uh, when someone sits down with you, they're, they're not just talking to someone who can t- they can talk to, but also someone who can prescribe, right? If, if there's a, a genuine imbalance in the, in the chemical in the brain, then then you can prescribe to help normalize that, right? Uh, cer- certainly, and I would I would uh, use caution against the word normalize. I okay. think normal is such a loaded term in our field, and I think really it's about helping folks be healthy. And if medication is a solution that somebody's open to and something that can help them, it's certainly one of the things that we can offer. Um, working in the hospital, a lot of my patients also have other medical conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes, minor infections. I may help them with those conditions as well, as long as it doesn't get too fancy. Uh, in which case I may call in help. So, sure. um, you know, it does mean that I get to treat a lot of general medical conditions on a basic level as well as prescribe medication for mental health conditions when it's appropriate. Now, one of the things that, that says it in your title is that you're also a hospitalist. And That's right. Yeah, I, I specifically spend 100 percent of my clinical time right now taking care of patients that have been hospitalized. Um, it's it's a little bit of a um, expertise just in terms of trying to be very efficient and learning somebody's vulnerability 
abilities and needs very quickly, as well as uh, trying to know what resources in the community. We try to keep hospitalizations, hospitalizations short. The goal of treatment is to get people out of the hospital, not to keep them there. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's really a, a matter of injecting hope rather quickly and helping people get through some of the things that have brought them in uh, and back to life. So at, at what point do the, do we, do the folks at, at St. Patrick Hospital know that uh, it's advanced from something that is just, you know, with with uh, psychotherapy that that involves would actually involve an actual work with a psychiatrist. The the criteria really is based around sort of a buzzword safety, mm-hmm. and and really we we want to keep people in their home lives as much as possible because that's what's going to help them be resilient. And again, that's what life is about. It really comes down to if somebody just can't be safe because they're they're becoming a, a threat to hurt themselves, a threat to hurt another family member, or just so. Uh, depressed, confused, or what have you, that they they can't even meet basic needs anymore, like getting food or taking care of basic hygiene. And then they're really at a point where they Mm -hmm. need that care. So we try to focus on on individuals that are at a point where it's just not safe if they're not in the hospital. Sure. Folks are are really used to the fact that, gosh, if I have a broken leg, I have to spend some time in the hospital. Or if, you know, I have an operation or a kidney replaced or whatever, I have to spend some time in the hospital. But uh, what about hospitalization for these types of issues? Is it is it sometimes involuntary, voluntary, or is it both? Or we what? certainly work with both patients. You know, I have, I have patients that come to us that are fully agreeing to be there. Um, some folks that are reluctantly agreeing to be there because you know they have got a family member saying you really need to do this. We're not comfortable having you at home anymore. We're super worried, so they sign in, but they're reluctant. And then we certainly deal with folks who just can't see their need because of how far. Um, impaired they are and really need somebody else to step in. But there's a court process to make sure that people's civil rights aren't violated. And I really welcome that. I, you know, we, we uh, have great working relationships with folks at the county attorney's office and the public defender's office. Anybody who's there involuntarily gets legal representation. And there's, there's due process to make sure there's nobody there who really doesn't need to be there, especially if they don't want to be. You know, I, I don't, I don't like keeping people locked up against their will. And uh, it's really nice to know that there's a court system involved providing that check and balance for me as well. What I'd like to do when we come back from our break, first of all, the lines are open. If you have a question, you can you can email a, or you can send a question via Facebook to John, who's been waiting waiting for those. Uh, 721-1290 is our number. Well, what I want to find out is when it, when it comes time to that your your treatment is over and people are headed out the door, what that means to you and how you judge when a person is ready to to go back and resume their normal lives. Can we do that when we come back? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're going to come right back. 721-1290 is our number, 1-800-568-5309. This is Health Talk, and we'll be right back. Hey, we're back on Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. This is Health Talk, sponsored by Providence Health and Services, Western Montana. Dr. Robert Moonjal is joining us. Dr. Rob, as he likes to be called, right? That's right, sure. All right, Dr. Rob. Okay, so now uh, we, we were talking during the break. Some pretty interesting things came up. One, one of that is is kind of a regional affectation that we hear oftentimes suicide uh, in in Missoula and Western Montana higher than some other places in the country. So how, how do you find as a psychiatrist that's treated people all over the country, uh, do you find that to be true or not? Absolutely. If you look at the statistics, Montana for the last 30 years has unfortunately been in the top five states as far as suicide rates go. And, you know, as much as we all love sort of the wide expanses and open spaces, the the great opportunities for adventure here, part of that is a culture of rugged individualism. And a lot of times folks are, uh, you know, very self-sufficient here. And and that's a wonderful thing, although uh, sometimes when people reach a tipping point where they cannot sustain their own mental well-being, I think it's a little bit harder for folks here in Montana to come and get that help. There's a lot of stigma either from family members or just – Uh, Living in small communities where you take care of yourself, the idea of kind of needing to let down those barriers and come get help. Uh, What if the neighbors start talking? You know, this is a small town. Everybody's going to know. And so I I see compared to other places that I've I've practiced that people just wait longer to come in and get that kind of help. Um, And so a lot of times problems are more severe. Uh, They're complex. It's not just one thing that's gone wrong. It's a number of things. Uh, the other thing that you really see a lot more here in Montana is, is the rates of substance abuse. Uh, these are, you know, hard, lonely, you know, places to be sometimes, especially in the winter months. People are inside a lot with not a lot to do. And alcohol becomes a very attractive way of dealing with some of that loneliness, some of those dark winter days. 
And when you throw alcohol on top of uh, depression, it's like adding uh, gasoline to a fire. And so we see the substance abuse issues here in Montana uh, also being a big problem. So how, how do you, as, as a psychiatrist, how do you, when someone comes to you with these kinds of problems, what's the first thing that you do when, when you sit down with them for the first time? Well, I think for, you know, a lot of patients, especially if they've never met with somebody in my field, my, my immediate um, my immediate intent is to make them feel relaxed and comfortable and to, to sort of establish this is just like any other doctor-patient relationship. You're, you're here with a certain set of problems. I'm here with a certain set of expertise. Let's talk together in a way that makes sense to you. Let's talk together in a way that helps you be vulnerable and open. Um, and let's try to figure out from your perspective, what are your goals and what are the most important things for you? If I really do my job right, how are you going to know? And I want to start from there because I don't want to start with any preconceived agenda of my own about what it means for somebody else to have good mental health or what it means for them to feel happy or be well. I, I want them to tell me. And once I have a sense of what they're looking for, what's not going wrong, we try to problem solve together. What are the best solutions for them? So basically, you people meet people where they are. I Absolutely. I think there's no other way to do this kind of work. And it's a big part of why I became a psychiatrist was because I really wanted to get to know people from all walks of life and hear their stories from their perspectives. It's it's one of the best things about what I get to do. Let me ask you something. Uh, th there has been so much talk recently uh, I, I, since the Marcus Karma trial, uh, the, the horrible tragedy that happened in South Carolina, where there are, there are signals and signs that people can see, whether it's a loved one or a friend or a co-worker, that th this person's troubled and they, well, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get help themselves. At what point do you think as a psychiatrist is a good time to say, you know, I need to contact somebody because I like this person and I want them to get help, but I don't want to be, you know, uh, pushy or shovey or whatever. Is, is there some level as a psychiatrist that you can say, this, this is a good, a good time to get in touch with somebody? You know, I think it's I think it's nuanced, and I think a lot of it involves a relationship that you're in. I I would always say your first point of contact should be that person. You know, you would never want to, uh, you know, answer your door to find that somebody had called the police to come cart you away to the right. funny farm without right, right. having first sat down with you and said, "Hey, buddy, I'm worried." So right, right. I think that the the place to begin is is never too soon on that level. On an interpersonal level, you know, if if you have a question. Um, I think it's always easy to regret not asking it, and if you come off wrong, it's it's certainly easy enough to apologize and mm -hmm. just say, "Look, I don't mean to be nosy. I just care. I'm just worried." Well, it's How kind of are like you? it's kind of like that phrase: "Friends don't let friends drive drunk." That's I, right. It's I, the I, same thing, right? Yeah, I think it's it's never too soon to just ask a very caring question, you know, at an appropriate moment to just kind of gauge where where somebody you care about is at, and uh, you know, I think it's a lot. You know, it's a lot more likely that one would regret not asking those questions later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly that doesn't make it anybody's fault uh, because a lot of the same warning signs that, that, you know, are clear in hindsight are never that way looking forward. You know, they only make sense through the future and, and sort of the events that play out. And, and looking backwards, there's lots of people that are at risk that are not doing violent things, that aren't committing suicide, that have a lot of the same risk factors. So I, I just think because they're there, we can't assume that everybody with those risks is going to act that way. So basically, the, the whole idea is if you've got a friend, be a friend, right? Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, again, it, it, every, every person in this world is carrying their own unique burdens. And uh, I don't think we pause often enough to just check in with each other and, and help ease one another's burdens. A lot of times life just gets too quick. We're focused on our own problems and we miss out on what our neighbors are dealing with, what our friends are dealing with. And, and somebody sometimes people just need a friend. I Absolutely. Mean, yeah, I certainly don't think that uh, psychiatric treatment specifically is always the solution, not for every person. I think that uh, plenty of times, um, you know, communities and people gathering around each other, um, you know, ultimately I like to think of what I do as a psychiatrist as loving people with professional knowledge and professional boundaries it's 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 just a, a very specific way of, of loving somebody and I don't I don't have any kind of unique claims on on being able to do that all right so let, let, let's talk specifically about some of the services that you offer within your department so can you kind of just give, give us a laundry list if you will of, of some of the things that, aside from you know sitting down and visiting with folks to, to prescribing drugs what other kind of things that's do you right do? so in in the psychiatric hospital in particular we have uh, social workers who do a lot of family outreach work 
and gather friends and families to help support uh, the patient in the hospital, uh, particularly when they leave. We try to make sure that there's a support system in place if there wasn't one before. So our social workers are really helpful with identifying uh, formal resources in the community, but also somebody's personal resources. Uh, we also have an occupational therapist that looks at, um, you know, what are some of the activities that are maybe missing from somebody's lives, interests that they used to have that they've lost, uh, maybe skills that they used to have that need to be adapted to their current disability. Um, so we have a comprehensive team. We have a dietitian who takes a look at the role that somebody's diet may be playing in their emotional state, or uh, a lot of our medications can have weight gain as a side effect, certainly not all of them, but, but looking at a diet that makes sense once you're on a medication that has that risk. Uh, so it's a pretty comprehensive approach. We like to involve uh, families and friends. Like I said, we, we welcome clergy to stop by and visit. So we provide a lot of sanctuary in the hospital. We, it's, it's really an opportunity to just sort of recalibrate support. Um, outpatient services, we have an urgent mental health clinic. And, um, you know, that might be a, a good first point of contact for somebody who's not got any sort of mental health support. Uh, we tend to be able to get appointments for folks within one to two weeks of, of that initial phone call. Um, and so if somebody doesn't absolutely need to be in the hospital but is in a crisis, that would be a great place to start. And then we have a, a group of psychiatrists that follow people for long term. So once somebody maybe gets past that point of crisis, if it's really clear that they'll need ongoing psychiatric care, we can refer to some of the psychiatrists in our group that see folks uh, you know, for years. What about, what about insurance? Um, so St. Patrick Hospital has a really uh, aggressive charity program. Certainly, if, if you have insurance, uh, we'd like to work with your insurance company. Uh, but the hospital is very invested in taking care of the poor. It's a big part of why I chose to work for St. Patrick Hospital. And it's a huge part of our mission to, to try not to let that affect patient care. I think there are some realities we have to pay to when it comes to – pay attention to when it comes to finances. But really, it's at the bottom of my list when I'm working with a patient. I, I'm focused on them, not how I'm getting paid. Okay. We're going to take a little break, and we have a Facebook comment. When we come back, we'll be right back. This is Health Talk. We'll continue in a moment. Hey, we're back on uh, Health Talk, sponsored by Providence Health and Services, Western Montana. Our guest in studio, Dr. Robert Moonjall, who is a psychiatrist at uh, Providence. And uh, so we have a Facebook comment. Yeah, that's right. Question, sorry. That's right. Uh, Katie on Facebook says, there are allegations that psychotropic drugs used to treat depression are actually a factor in sending teens especially over the edge into psychotic behavior. Is that true or not? Uh, certainly a psychotic episode could be an extremely rare side effect of an antidepressant, um, most particularly if that antidepressant can precipitate a manic episode. So a lot of folks have heard of bipolar disorder. And those two poles, one pole is a manic pole, the other one is a depressed pole. And sometimes we do see antidepressants drive somebody out of not just a depression, but into a full-fledged mania where there's an upswing in energy, but it's not really a good thing. It's, it's actually a negative thing. It can be a pretty destructive episode episode. And a lot of folks at, at the peak of a manic episode may have psychosis. So it's not very common that um, an antidepressant will make somebody psychotic. It's certainly possible. In terms of the data on antidepressants in teenagers or adolescents in particular, there definitely is some reason to think that they work a little bit more unpredictably in terms of treatment benefits in developing brains. There's not a lot of research for any kind of permanent damage from antidepressants, so they certainly can be reasonable to trial uh, with very minimal risks. The FDA did put a black box warning on antidepressants for adolescents and young adults uh, some years ago. Um, since that warning came out, you saw a lot of general practitioners and pediatricians in particular reduced the number of antidepressants they were prescribing to teenagers. And since then, we've actually have some data to suggest that the, the black box warning may not have been fully accurate and that there was an increase after that in some rates of teenage suicidal behavior, teenage depression after the warning came out. So it's not clear cut. Um, and so I certainly don't think there's any hard or fast answer as to whether or not antidepressants are the right solution in teenage depression. A lot of times therapy is, is a better solution, especially in young adults and teenagers. So is the whole idea trying to uh, uh, use these drugs for a specific purpose and then wean the, the, the patient off of them as quickly as possible? It really depends. If you take depression in particular as an example, if you've had one episode of a very severe clinical depression, the chances of having a second or around 
50%. If you have a second, the chances of having a third are around 70%. If you've had three episodes over the course of your life of severe depression, the chances of another one are around 90%. And so in a case like that where somebody's very clearly had you know repeated episodes and has become suicidal during these episodes, it can be a complicated question as to when it's the right time to come off of a medication. So if we can get somebody off of a medication, we like to, but we can't always. Uh, unfortunately, we – well – all right, we have, we, have, we have less than a minute. So, Mike, if you can answer, ask your question in 10 seconds, go. Couldn't hear him, but he asked, what is good mental health? Yeah. You could give us a definition. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think Sigmund Freud got everything right. But there was one thing that he said that I still think holds true. He, he defined good mental health as the ability to love and the ability to work. And I would say work doesn't mean strictly employed labor. But really, if you can maintain meaningful relationships and you feel like you're contributing in some meaningful way to the world around you, that's good mental health. How do we contact your agency there? At sure. If you are looking uh, to get an outpatient appointment, probably the best number to call is for our urgent mental health clinic, and that is 406-327-3034. And if you think you need a hospitalization, the best number to call is 406-327-3011. And that's going to do it for Health Talk. Thank you for joining us. We'll do it again next week.